so firstly, I'd just like to introduce Phil, who is the, um, sorry, slipped me my notes, the uh, Diocesan Environmental uh, Officer, who's leading the uh, Net Zero Carbon team. And he's just gonna introduce this uh, programme and uh, just to explain a little bit more about the, uh, the net zero definition and how that all links in with uh, what we're looking at today in terms of travel. So Phil, I'll just hand over to you. Okay, thanks. And thanks everyone for joining us this evening. So by way of an introduction to the net zero programme and the Eco Church programme, in 2020, the Church of England uh, General Synod voted for the Church of England to become net zero carbon by 2030. And since then we've been working as a team to put together a programme to move the diocese towards this. And now we're busy working with churches on achieving this goal. We've also done work around measuring the footprint of the diocese and found that we have a collective footprint in the diocese of almost 10,000 tonnes of carbon and CO2 per year. And that includes 3,900 tonnes for church buildings, 3,800 tonnes for schools, 1,300 tonnes for vicarages, 700 tonnes for the cathedral and 70 tonnes for the diocesan offices. And we've yet to do any measuring around travel, but we'll need to add that to the total when we do. So the likelihood is that the actual total for the diocese will be well over 10,000 tonnes of CO2 per year. And our programme involves two strands, as you've just heard. We've got the prophetic work, which is based around the Eco Church. Uh, many of you will be familiar with that. And Faith for Change team are working hard on delivering that. And then there's also the technical strand, which involves measuring carbon footprints and looking at how buildings can be adapted to meet the net zero 2030 target. And Rob Wallace and I are working on that together. Aspects of the Church of England's carbon footprint covered in the 2030 target include energy used in buildings, including churches, cathedrals, schools, clergy housing and offices. And it also includes work-related travel, including train journeys and flights. And this might be journeys made by clergy, committee members or volunteers on church business, but it doesn't include journeys to and from church by congregations. And it's really early days, both nationally and in the diocese when it comes to thinking about travel, but there are already some information available on the Church of England website, which I'll, I'll pop the link for that in the chat after. We're also very aware it doesn't really cover as much of the travel footprints as we might expect, but Eco Church, the Eco Church programme encourages us to go much further and encourages us to think about how all our daily travel, um, how we can address that too. So on that note, I, I look forward to hearing what's to come in the next hour and I'll hand you back to Emma. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce uh, Hugh Jenkins to you, who is our first speaker this evening. So he, Hugh has worked in the Liverpool city region, uh, responsible for a range of transport policy roles for the past 21 years. His main role is the future plans and policies for transport in the Liverpool city region and is currently working on a new transport plan that will set out how transport will support our city's commitment to be a net zero carbon emitting city region by 2040. So this will include how transport will support this goal alongside other priorities such as better health, a fair and equitable transport system and good access to everyday facilities. So Hugh, over to you, thank you. No, thanks very much. Um, thanks for inviting me along. Uh, can I just check you can hear me okay? My headphones are plugged in properly. Yeah, it's all good. Excellent. Um, I may get ambushed by my son any second. I can hear him pounding up the stairs, uh, but no, I think he's gone to his room. So there we go. Um, <laughs> Don't worry. But I, I do have a few slides to share. Um, and as we were chatting about, uh, a lot of those you can take away. There's some information in there. There's some web links. So I won't talk through them because I've only got 10 minutes. I think subject to Don arriving, I think I've got 10 minutes maximum, haven't I? So I'll, I'll kind of focus on, on some of the sort of hearts and minds and some of the sort of big sort of behavioral type things that I think would be much more interesting. Um, but what I will try to do now, if I can just share my screen. Bear with me for one second. 
Thank you. I think you're okay for those extra five minutes because Don isn't here, so feel free. Okay. That's great. Okay. Thank you. So let me share my screen and hopefully um, is is this working? Yeah. Excellent. I'm a terrible multitasker as well, I'm afraid. So I, I can't actually make the computer work and, and talk uh, <laughs> sensibly at the same time. So um, unfortunately, everything, I can't see any of you now, unfortunately. Um, but if you just shout up, then uh, just stop me in my tracks. But am I OK to talk for a little longer than 10 minutes then? That's fine, Hugh. Yeah, go um, for it. Just, just stop me. But um, um, but yeah, thanks for introducing me, and again, thanks for the thanks for the invitation. Really pleased to join you uh, and to discuss what I've, I've called here our collective journey to net zero. Really, uh, so you've heard who I am, uh, and uh, I also live in the Liverpool city region. Um, I'm currently in uh, rainy and slightly blustery Crosby, uh, as I think uh, a number of other other members of this uh, of this call are too. Uh, so. You'll be familiar with the Liverpool City region, just by way of a, by way of context. It's the the collective umbrella for the six local authorities uh, of Wirral, Liverpool, Sefton, Nosley, St Helens, and Holton. So, collective population of some 1.6 million people. And our Metro Mayor, so my political leader, is is Steve Rotherham, our directly elected mayor. So, I'm an officer uh, of the combined authority, the same as Mark, who's on the call. Um, so, my role is to to provide advice and make recommendations to to members. This is the, the overview, this is the exam question I've been set. Um, so how we can help our people and clergy to understand how they can make significant changes to the way they move around their parishes for work each day. Uh, and I'm also gonna quickly bring in how this relates to the related ambitions of the combined authority. So hopefully what I'll get across here is that our vision is, is very, very similar. We're all, we're all coming at this from the, same, uh, from the same place, which is always a, a great place to start clearly. Uh, and I'll quickly set out some of our plans and programs in response to some of the challenges. And I've got a couple of practical ideas and solutions that we can pick up at the end as well. So really interesting to hear about your highly ambitious target as a church, as a diocese to 2030. Um, our target as a city region is 2040 to be net zero. So we're 10 years ahead of the national, um, the national legislative um, deadline. You're clearly 20 years. So. I think what this shows for transport, if you look at the black line, that shows where we're, where we're going now and have been going since about 2005. Uh, we're not really doing very well in transport terms, are we? Uh, transport is some one third of all of our carbon emissions as a Liverpool city region. It's a big chunk, a very big chunk, and it's not really going anywhere as we all tend to, and certainly pre-COVID, travelled more, more of us turning to cars, more car trips, and very often longer car trips being made as well. The pandemic has, affected that has changed that quite radically whether that's a blip or a longer term trend is something we're looking quite closely at now but what you can see here is the very very steep curve that we need to go down to get to net zero carbon by 2040. Um, so if we follow the uh, that light blue line at the top that's business as usual we get nowhere um, but we either follow uh, what's called the Tyndall curve which is that purple curve where we make changes very quickly we make deep changes quickly or a, a more linear or a more linear trajectory, which is that orange one, but you can still see the, the huge change that we need to achieve and the huge changes we need to make to the way we travel and how we how we travel. That quote there, I won't read it out, but the pathway is the equivalent of taking 30,000 fossil fuels off the road in the LCR each year. So there's the there's the challenge. The scale of the opportunity is evident. So an awful lot of trips, too many trips. Uh, within this is Merseyside because the data is split by Merseyside rather than the Liverpool city region um, but you get the idea three quarters of all our trips or sorry two thirds of all of our trips are actually less than five kilometers in length so around three miles uh, and 83 percent of those are less than 10 kilometers so about six seven miles or thereabouts but actually most of those are driven um, and when we look at our carbon emissions when we look at our carbon trajectory it's a car-based problem, pretty much. Uh, vans are a big part, HGVs are a part, heavy goods vehicles are a part as well. As you can see from this little picture here that's in our decarbonisation plan, cars are producing about 67% of our carbon emissions in the Liverpool city region. The other side of that coin are all the other harms and uh, disbenefits that arise from, from private cars. Uh, poor air quality is one very, very sobering one uh, that kills 800 people a year across the Liverpool city region. That's it's wholly unacceptable. That's uh, exhaust emissions, nitrogen dioxide emissions that lead to asthma and other other related 
uh, problems um, that that do lead to mortality very very sadly and and there's also the very very direct um, and very stark problem that we have as well from the fact that people are killed and seriously injured on the roads so traffic and transport tragically kill people um, and we've set a new target as a city region to to be uh, vision zero so just as we want to be net zero in carbon terms we want to be vision zero in terms of we don't want any serious or serious injuries or deaths on our roads at all we've set numerical targets for many many years um, but that isn't that isn't acceptable now that's not acceptable to our mayor we don't see any deaths or serious injuries on our roads that's a very clear target but again some big sort of knock-on implications for how we respond to that so journeys how are we going to tackle this problem this is self-evident so from our carbon plan and um, take this away um, i'll share the slides and you can just log on to this link here to read our plan that includes uh, how we're going to respond to energy how we're going to respond to housing this is just a snapshot of transport and journeys i think we all know the challenges don't we we need to walk more cycle more switch to clean public transport move away from petrol and diesel cars to electric vehicles um, move more of our freight by railways um, can we move more of our freight by inland waterways for example so they don't need to go on the roads at all and all that leads to a benefit and equally, as we move away from petrol and diesel, so you won't be able to buy a new petrol and diesel car after 2030, they are being made illegal. Um, we will go to electric, typically electric for cars and potentially for bigger trucks to, to fuel such as hydrogen. So we will, we will get benefits uh, as we move away from, from petrol and diesel. But at the same time, we do need to, to shift the way we travel to using, to using our wheels, to using our feet, to using mass transit much, much more. So we're aware that there are big challenges facing us, but as a city region, the positive news I've got is that we are able, you know, we've got, we've got a plan uh, to start to address these challenges. So we have very recently secured 710 million of funding from the government for the next five years. It's called the Sustainable Transport Settlement. So it does exactly what it says on the tin. It is a fund to improve sustainable transport across the Liverpool city region over the next five years. And that funding with other funds that have been committed now are, are going to hopefully see some very big changes uh, to how we travel and the offer, the travel offer across the city region, uh, the new Merseyrail trains that we hope we will see uh, later on in the autumn, uh, new stations to extend the reach of the rail network, a uh, new station that we're looking at or that is in the process of being built now in, in the Tower Hill area of Kirby, quite an isolated part of the Liverpool city region now, but a new station in development there and a new station that we are planning at the Baltic Triangle in Liverpool. We're developing, uh, we have huge plans for rolling out uh, what we call active travel. So active travel is basically walking, cycling, wheeling and scooting. Um, we have big plans for rolling out safe walking and cycling routes across the Liverpool city region, 600 kilometres of those. A clear vision for bus, you know, not to be the Cinderella form of transport, but to be reliable, to be attractive, to be clean. Uh, and we're also investing in hydrogen buses now, uh, to, as I say, to, to make that change away from uh, from diesel in the case of buses that that are bad for carbon and bad for air quality as well, bad for health. Uh, and not to forget as well about about freight logistics. We're a we're a port city region, as we all know. Um, you know, the river is the lifeblood of the city and the city region. But we also know that freight brings big challenges to the city region as well. Um, as we move more and more things by by truck or by white vans, you know, those of us that. Uh, have really taken the home shopping, particularly since the pandemic. Uh, and we have to look at the number of vans in our road, for example. We have a real problem there as well. So how can we look at kind of reducing the number of vans, the number of deliveries, uh, and shifting those either onto cleaner vehicles, moving on to the rail network, and ideally moving some of those onto, onto foot and by bike as well, some of the more traditional ways of moving goods that we're now seeing with the likes of, of Uber Eats, you know, using a, a network of bikes to move, in this case, food. So as we as we heard about in the introduction we're uh, it's very timely we're developing a new transport plan now for the city region to take us to 2040 feel free to read that um, high level document there at your leisure i won't talk through it here uh, what we've done at this stage is set out a fairly high level document with a series of uh, visions and goals uh, the policies the detail the funding will follow but it'll be closely related to that 710 million and future funds that i talked about uh, and what you can see very clearly here is that we've got a very explicit goal about being net zero carbon emitting by by 2040 but also you'll also see there 
the the real importance we're attaching to health, quality of life, people, communities. You know, for too long we thought about transport as the movement of vehicles or the movement of traffic, whereas it's it's a very obvious point. But we are we are a society, um, and we've very often forgotten, or we've too often forgotten about how people interact, how people move, how people interact. Uh, it's one of the few positives that we saw from the pandemic, uh, where people did start to socially distance, but people did start to get out and about and see their communities more uh, as they went out for their hour of exercise every day, for example. So we recognise that health dimensions massively important, uh, and really the first goal there is about making sure that transport supports what we need to support again an obvious point but we sometimes forget what transport's there for it's to move people to school to church to work it's to move our goods it's to go on holiday it's to do nice things it's to do things that we need to do um and you know move, move freight um around the country for example these are this is what transport needs to do but it's really clear it's really important that we're clear about what we need to do so that the responses are the right ones if I'm okay for time, I'll, I'll just cover this briefly. Uh, I think this is the real challenge that we've got, and I'm sure you've you've discussed this as a church, as a diocese, uh, in terms of your your 2030 challenges and how you get people to to be supporting this you know this massive target that we've all set for absolutely the right reasons. You know, how are we going to get people to be doing what I set out in that earlier slide? So you know, making less use of their cars, um, using clean, safe mass transit bus the train much much more use of walking cycling and scooting recognizing that an awful lot of trips are actually very very short but we're on the habit now really of jumping in our cars it's, we're busy there's things to do the kids need to be dropped off but how can we start to break some of that and i've tried to kind of encapsulate some of that in this slide here called hearts and minds um advert there on the left the the craven a cigarette i think this is from the states in the 1920s um you know there there's a lady um, a very, uh, very glamorous lady advertising cigarettes. These cigarettes won't affect your throat. You know, it's the thing to do. Well, of course, we know that is wholly preposterous. We know now, thank goodness, the, the catastrophic link between smoking and ill health. But this was accepted 100 years ago. Um, you know, your doctor recommended certain types of cigarettes because they won't affect your throat. That was the way we accepted things 100 years ago. If we fast forward to Barbara Castle, there's pictures on the right hand side. Slightly more recent, they were from the 1960s, but Barbara Castle was the transport minister who introduced the breathalyzer and made seatbelts mandatory in, in new cars. The backlash at the time, um, many of you may, may have remembered this, may have been around at the time, it was just before my time, but the backlash was phenomenal. This was taking away people's civil liberties. This was Big Brother. This was stopping people from doing what they want to do. If someone wants to go out and drink three or four pints of beer, why shouldn't they do that? Well, we learn from that. We know why people shouldn't do that. We know what the implications, we know what the health uh, implications are. We know what the, the social damage of people being killed and seriously injured on the roads entail, the heartbreak. And we've learned from that. And we've known, we now know that these ways of, of doing things, of behaving, of selling, of advertising things just, just don't stack up anymore. And it, it kind of brings us full circle to where we are now. Uh, again, this is an ultimate slide. But we've got real polarised views on transport as well. Um, so if you look to the right hand side of my slide here, you know, you've got a petition here, a change.org petition against cycle lanes in Southport. Um, so, you know, real vociferous lobby of people, uh, many thousands of people, actually a thousand and one, I think, were, were when I took that screenshot, who are opposing you know, the installation of new cycle lanes within Southport. Similarly, the picture above there, LTNs are low traffic neighbourhoods, and um, this is from, I think this is from Camden in London. So again, um, people demonstrating on the streets, not wanting their roads to be blocked off to traffic, not wanting, you know, the cycling and walking facilities that would come with that. Very strong feelings there. But equally, we know that these are the things, these are the tough things like smoking and drink driving and speeding and wearing seatbelts that we do need to tackle, in this case, to get to net zero car by 2040. We do need to plan our roads differently. We do need more walking and cycling lanes because people tell us that if the facilities were safer, they would walk and cycle more. There's very, very strong evidence to show that. Uh, and where measures have gone in place, people have responded. You build it, they do come. And similarly, that picture on the left there, 
we're going to get more people on the bus as we need to for those reasons I talked about and make the bus more attractive. You need to give priority to the bus. You need to give a side space from the private car, from general traffic for the bus. But when that involves taking out um, car parking, where it involves taking out on-street parking on streets uh, or outside shops, people do get very agitated by that. But we also know that, you know, people, people's behavior is a very, very powerful thing. So this picture here is not from the city region, top left is uh, of a school street. So I think this could be from Bristol, either Bristol or London. This is a school that um, took it upon themselves to arrange for the roads to be closed at certain times of the day, of the week. So the children could just play out. Um, the children can experience their environment in a very, very different way, not being dominated by traffic and cars parked all over the pavement as you usually have. Uh, living in Crosby, we have a lot of schools, we have a lot of traffic, we have awful school traffic. Uh, but this is an example of, of what you can achieve when, when the community uh, want to do that. And that's the sort of change we need to deliver. Equally, the, the picture at the bottom, or sorry, the picture in the middle is of the e-scooter trial in Liverpool. Uh, it's interesting, you may all have different views on e-scooters. These are the automated scooters uh, that you can hire by the minute and, and whiz around the city centre. They don't extend into outlying areas as yet, but you can hire them by the minute. And, and whiz around the city um, at, at no more than 15 miles an hour if you've got a driving license. That's the that's the main stipulation. Um, again, polarized views. Some people see them as a nuisance, uh, get in the way. Why aren't people just walking and cycling? Why are they on the pavement? But there's a lot of evidence growing that actually for younger people, solutions like e-scooters could well be a really attractive alternative to buying and running a car. If we're going to break that sort of car-based dependency, car usage. But actually, could things like e-scooters uh, and you know electric bikes help address some of our transport challenges? Uh, help address some of our big carbon and air quality problems. Um, that's that's a really uh, interesting one to do with technology and the future. And I think the final quote there in the middle. Uh, this is a reminder, I think, about the technological fix. Uh, as Paul Winton says here, if all we do is swap our cars for electric ones and behave the same way. We'll end up with cities that are more congested and cleaner. And I think it's important we don't forget about that because it's back to the vision we're setting around streets for people, uh, making places livable and attractive. Um, and if, if our streets are congested with electric cars and people are tragically getting killed and seriously injured by electric cars, I'm not sure that's the future we want to see either. Uh, I think the future is more around this left hand side of the screen here of people using roads for different purposes. Uh, and giving less priority and dominance to the car. So my final slide uh, is, if, if I'm still okay for time here without without Don, um, I think you were keen to, to look at some practical solutions. What can we all do? You know, what can we do as a church? What can we do as, as employers? What can we do as individuals? You know, this, if we're not all on board with this agenda, we're not gonna see that change, are we? So, you know, some of the practical solutions here, I've got some links in the slides that follow. Um, can we look at developing and be interested to kind of hear your perspective of how, how widespread this is in the church and in your, in your dioceses? Um, do we routinely develop travel plans for, for sites and premises or projects? And a, a travel plan is basically thinking about how people will get to a venue. How are people going to get there? Uh, what about people who've got specific needs? What about people with specific disabilities or challenges? It's thinking about how people will travel and planning. I think the important point is planning for how people will get there without needing to use a car. Um, and that leads to, you know, looking at the site. Uh, so if you're promoting um, an event, if you're promoting an activity, it's an obvious point again, but we don't always think about this from the start. Is it an accessible site? Can you get there using the bus? Is it next to a train station? Is it on a cycle route? Or is it actually on, probably a bad example from, uh, for, from many perspectives, but is it just off the motorway junction? Uh, and therefore, it's going to be no surprise when those people turn up by car because you can't actually get there in any other way. Is travel essential for a meeting? And I think, you know, three years ago, we would all have been in a meeting room somewhere doing this. Uh, we're all, I think, across the country, across the Liverpool City region now. Is travel essential now? Um, we are social beings. We absolutely, you know, we were all desperate to get back to see people after the pandemic. But I'm now asking myself, do I really need to travel for that meeting? Do I really need to go to London to meet with the Department for Transport? Um, actually, the answer more often than not is, is no. I can do that on Teams or Zoom quite happily and save a lot of money and a lot of time in that process. Um, you mentioned aviation at the start. You know, that's one of our big uh, challenges um, in, in lots and lots of ways. It's, it's an industry that's very, very challenged. I completely appreciate by the pandemic. But 
pre-pandemic, you know, we were hearing examples of people flying out for, you know, a two-hour meeting in India. Uh, is that really kind of sensible? Is that really environmentally just? Not sure it is. And, and hopefully this is where this sort of technology can, can play a greater role. Are we doing enough to buddy people? I think we sometimes forget that people need handhold and people need support. And we, we know this acutely as a command authority. So it's, it's one thing providing a better bus service, accessible buses, hydrogen buses, bus lanes. But if you're not giving people information about how to catch the bus, how easy it is, how you get information about real time on your phone, how easy is it to pay? How do you take the guesswork out of it? Can you take someone on a bus and kind of show them and take some of the guesswork out of it? I think that we, we forget that that buddying, that support package is, is so important. And that leads to that penultimate point, which is incentives. So again, as an employer, as a church, are you looking at things, are you thinking of things like a bike mileage allowance scheme, for example? So do you generally pay people a casual car user rate or could you also offer a bike mileage scheme? Is there cycle parking, is there somewhere to change? Could you offer someone a public transport pass to make a particular journey or a set of journeys? Um, are there e-charges to encourage electric, electric vehicles to be charged at your facilities, at your premises? These are all the things we need to make that change. And equally, a bit, a bit like that example of the school that I showed you, which either in Bristol or London, I must, I, must, I must work out where it is. Can you reduce your car parking provision as well? This is always one of the more challenging ones. This is one of the very controversial ones. But actually, if you take space away uh, for car, from cars and kind of give it over to, I don't know, planters or a children's play area or just a community space, you know, that's a very often a much nicer use of space. It's more human use of space. It also discourages you know, car use and car dependency. Is that an option? But this information, information, information one is, is a really key point, which is why I'm so pleased to engage with you here, because we can't do net zero alone. We, we all have to, to work together. So um, hope that helps set the scene. That's me. And you can take the slides away. I've got some web links here to some travel information, some really good advice from Energy Saving Trust. Sustrance and Living Streets are two charities that are promoting walking and cycling. There's some really good information there about travel plans as well that I touched on. So I will stop. I will stop sharing there. And hopefully thanks. the screen will return to normal. Oh, thanks ever so much, Hugh. Thank if you. I could just bring uh, Mark Knowles in here and then we'll, uh, there's a couple of questions and perhaps Mark, if I just introduce you and you might be able to add something uh, along with Hugh. So Mark is the lead officer for energy and industry at Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. Uh, he's responsible for ensuring the city region has the appropriate amount of clean energy generation and distribution infrastructure to enable our transport, buildings and industry to meet our net zero targets by 2040. Liverpool Transport, public and private, is in a transition period from an oil-based system to a new energy mix that will use electricity, hydrogen and ammonia that will be accessible to all communities and citizens. So that's just a little introduction for Mark there, but there is a, a question um, that perhaps you two might be able to answer. So essential travel by clergy and senior diocesan staff is part of the Net Zero plan. How can the combined authority uh, support us to make this a reality? Thank you. Do you want me to pick this off to start, Hugh, and then? Yeah. By all means, Mark. People have heard enough from me. <laughs> Uh, well, this is the this is the double act. This is a comedic double act. Um, thanks, everybody. I just a couple of things just really to add um, to what Hugh said, and I think it's really important that that the critical point that Hugh made there, which is about we're not looking to replace um, an existing transport system, like for like every vehicle for every vehicle that might move to electric or hydrogen. What we're trying to do, our our hierarchy is to try to remove vehicles wherever it makes sense and is possible to do and switch journeys. Um, so journeys that people don't have to make because from a planning point of view, all the way at strategic level that we build communities where at a, a people based level. So you don't necessarily have to make lots of journeys, whether it's to move from where you live to a school or work. You know, these are journeys that aren't discretionary. These are journeys that people have to make at the moment because of the way we design our cities and our, our communities. So that's right the way through from that kind of strategic level in terms of planning, but then all the way down through in terms of making sure that alternatives are not just viable, but are attractive. Um, you know, we've all seen examples where, you know, kind of things like uh, dedicated cycle routes, but, you know, really just some white lines on a, 
um, on a very busy road is that something that we'd we particularly find attractive or, or user friendly so that there is you know the quality of um of alternatives is really important um but i guess where i come in on this is then from a, a point of view of whatever transport we're going to have left um and vehicles that are going to need to be do then obviously as you said we now have national targets that by 2030, so what, only eight years from now, or seven and a half years from now, um, no vehicle will be produced in the UK that's burning either petrol or diesel. Um, so if you work on the average, the average life expectancy of a vehicle is about five years, then you're really seeing just under one further cycle before you see most vehicles will have to be moved over. That's obviously 2030, and it's important to state, 2030 is the date for new vehicles. Uh, it's not a date to take all vehicles that are already on the roads off off the road, uh, but clearly uh, that transition will start to come in, and it started to move quite quickly. To a point now where in the last 12 months, um, over 25% of all new vehicles, uh, all new cars registered have been uh, battery electric. Bear in mind that two years ago, that figure that this in the last 12 months is now at, at rolling average is 25%. Two years ago, that average was 2%. So there's been a huge increase. And also the point at the moment is that, as we've all seen, there's um, a severe breakdown at the moment in the in the production of all new vehicles, primarily being driven by um, problems in the supply chain of things like computer chips that go into virtually every vehicle, whether they be cars, buses, trucks. Um, at the moment, that's a global shortage. Um, so that's suppressing demand or suppressing supply for all new vehicles. Um, and but again we expect in the next 12 months for that those supply chain issues to be addressed at which point you would expect to see the the increase in supply of vehicles that at the moment is artificially curtailed um to start to pick up so you're starting to see a very rapid change now um in towards um, things like electric vehicles certain electric cars Critical to that, though, obviously, if you're going to have that those kind of vehicles, then is you're going to have to have the energy systems to go with it. And so that's a movement from the, the kind of the last hundred years we've all got used to. You, know, you pick a petrol or diesel car or van or minibus, and it come when you go off to the petrol station, you fill it with fuel, either again petrol or diesel. Um, to now having to replicate that new system, which is electric charging primarily. Um, and again, as you said, what we expect to see is you've got um, electric for uh, private cars and light vans moving through to hydrogen for heavy trucks um, and things like buses. And that's primarily because of the, vol the volume of batteries that those heavier vehicles would require. So a hydrogen uh, bus or a truck runs in exactly the same process. It's an electric vehicle. It's just rather than storing all the energy uh, on board in batteries, it generates its own electricity through a hydrogen fuel cell. But the fuel cell produces electricity and is then pushed through. So there's an awful lot of commonality with it. So back to the point about electric um, vehicles and the requirement for charging infrastructure. This is a really key priority for us as a city region and is the same yeah, at national and international level is that choreography between the move towards electric vehicles and then having the charging infrastructure to support that. In simple terms, you've now got a system where you've got different types of charging infrastructure in different settings. So primarily you see charging infrastructure that's designed around um, time. So if you're going to be in a car park, say at a rail station or a ferry terminal, um, and you're going to be there for, or say a hotel car park, and you're going to be there for hours, then you see what's called seven kilowatt charges. So these are charges that can put in a small amount of charge, but that equates to something meaningful over a longer period of time, say a, a whole day at work while you, uh, while the car's parked or overnight in say a car park. But increasingly what you're then seeing now is a move towards ever faster charges. So to a point now where the fastest charges can charge virtually you know, charge the car from zero to 80% now in less than 20 minutes. And so you're starting to see lots of charges starting to appear in, in all sorts of places. Um, and initially these were single charges in back of supermarket car parks or those kind of places. Um, 
you're now starting to see um, retail forecourts. So we've had two announcements in the last fortnight where um, if you know Edge Lane, um, that's going to be site of one of the biggest forecourts in the UK. So that's going to have 26 chargers. Um, that, so you can charge 26 cars at the same time. So that's a very significant amount of, of uplift. But I think there is an opportunity here for, for you as a diocese and for individual church organisations that if you have um, car parks um, or you have land, the charging companies are actively looking for sites at the moment, are really looking for, you know, for as many sites as they can get hold of. Um, so if you have a site, if you have a car park, it's a way of it generates, potentially starting to generate revenue for the church um, or school even, um, where these, these charges can be put, if you have basically one or two parking spaces available, and again, an electricity supply, and uh, you know, the companies involved can find, can do that kind of research for themselves. Um, but it is a potential new source of revenue for um for you as um, individual organisations. So where, for example, the Gloucester Diocese um, have done an awful lot of work on this. And there's a, there's a quite a significant number of, um, of church and school car parks now that have had charges fitted to them. And again, they've, been, they've used a, a third party operator, um, but actually been able to, be able to create both a, a community service and amenity for the community. Um, but obviously also something that, that generates a not insubstantial amount of revenue, which again helps um, provide a new revenue stream for, you know, for that local community. So there are options you know, that can be potentially explored. Um, the, if you want to look whether or not, in terms of where the nearest charges might be to, to your locations at the moment, there's a, a free app or a website called ZapMap. And again, I can put that into the chat. Uh, but that is a, a free to use um, app or mapping service that has every charger in the UK on there. So that might be quite interesting in terms of A, if you're considering these types of vehicles for, you know, for the kind of work that you do um, and you're trying to work out whether they, whether they might be feasible, um, but also to look to see what's around you. And if you're in a good location, um, yeah, that there is there's certainly merit and you know to consider in terms of of utilizing some of those some of the assets that you have mark thank you so much just feel like we need to jump in i'll move on a little bit poor hillary's been waiting very patiently we can pick up on some of these other points and questions uh, at the end if people want to or uh, alternatively we can get some information out to folk who've asked questions um but thank you so much for your input um, so we're just going to move on to the, the activism part of this evening. Uh, I just want to introduce Hilary Bond. Um, so this is just a little bit that she's written about herself. So for whom the church and her love of creation has always been a part of her life and the two are deeply connected since discovering uh, Franciscan spirituality 15 years ago. Feeling desperate about the lack of change, even after writing letters, lobbying her MP and signing peti petitions, she joined Christian Climate Action and Extinction Rebellion and got involved in non-violent action. As a Christian, she is compelled by her faith to follow Jesus, who spoke truth to power out of his love for the world, even to his death. Hillary has been arrested four times, but continues to draw attention to the climate crisis to challenge those in power to do something about it. Hilary, thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think I'm probably the one person here who doesn't know the Diocese of Liverpool. I'm based in Dorset. Um, so apologies if some of this doesn't transfer to, to where you are, but I'm gonna give it a shot anyway, coming from a very different point of view from the, the two previous speakers. There's obviously loads of really good stuff going on up there already, and it's so good to hear. The one thing that I really struggled with when I was reading the, um, the plans for net zero carbon for the church is that um, there seems to be a separation between looking at what clergy and church officers are doing at the moment and then bringing the congregation on board at some point down the road. It's my feeling that if we really count ourselves as Christian community that we can't do that. We're, we're all in this together, aren't we? So. Um, travel and activism almost invariably 
after I've been on some sort of protest or action, we share on social media what we've been doing. And then it's usually about three comments down the, the, the stream that somebody in the spirit of criticism asks about how we got there. They bring up transport. It's something that really matters. So before Easter, I was part of some of the Just Stop Oil protests. Now, I'm sure there are people here who are really supportive, and I'm equally sure there'll be other people who think that some of the things we did were really wrong. Um, that's maybe a conversation for another day, which I'm really happy to have if you want to. But one of the things that we got a lot of flack for as protesters was the fact that the only way to get to some of the sites that we were disrupting was in a car. And those cars were not always electric. So we were using the very fossil fuel products that we were there to protest against. And it's always, it's always really at the top of my mind that activism, whether it's about travel or anything else, can never mean, will never mean, that the person who's engaged in the activism has already got it all together, that they're perfect and they have it sorted. We're all complicit in this because at the moment our society doesn't let us be anything else. It sounds like society in Liverpool is trying really hard to change that and it's brilliant. But what we're challenging here is huge. It's society in a way of life that's been ours for a really long time. Um, it's a big thing to try and change, really, really big. So I'm just going to share a bit of a story about my husband. He's an ecological contractor. His business uses big machines to rescue endangered habitat in an environmentally sensitive way. And he rides a bike. He has a, a nice electric bike that helps him get up hills in a way that mine doesn't. But um, last, last November, he was going off to a meeting somewhere that was all about things green. The MP for that area was going to be there. And Will decided that he was going to make a point that he was going to ride his bike to the meeting. It was about, about 25 miles away. So he hopped on his bike on November the 5th and off he pedaled. Uh, he got to the meeting. It was raining. He took off his coat and he was wearing a T-shirt that said, uh, one earth, one future, one chance on it. And the MP thought this was really good. So the MP had his picture taken alongside Will and his bike and his T-shirt. And the MP then put it out on his Twitter feed. That's a really good bit of gentle activism. It's brilliant riding your bike to church or to anything else that you're doing. It's even better if you use it to make a point so that other people notice what you are doing and ask you why you're doing it. It's not the same as sitting in a road and risking an arrest. It's something that anybody can do because activism is about doing. It's about getting to a place where it's not enough to just sit and talk about stuff anymore. It's about using your actions to highlight the issue and to get other people on board. There is a statistic that I believe to be true that says that once you've got 3.5% of the population on, on board with something, then numbers start to landslide and things really begin to change. So my thinking is that if within a church community, you can get 3.5% of that population on board, then things that have up till now only been the preserve of the resident eco nut can suddenly become part of what's normal. So, um, so what to do, some practical stuff. Talk about it to start with, whatever it is you choose to do, talk about it. So we've talked a lot about electric cars they're, they're not without environmental impact, as I think it was Stephen said in the chat. They're not a perfect solution, but they have a lot of upsides. I read something in Ethical Consumer actually this week that said hybrid cars, which a lot of people think are a great thing, are actually no better than petrol cars unless you use them really carefully. There's al always the idea of car leasing and sharing. There's also the possibility of giving it up altogether. I think it was Stephen who's just just put in that he's surrendered his uh, his car license and given up his car. It's a big thing to do. 
And I have to say that going green, especially with travel, it's really not convenient. So I've had an electric car for four years and sometimes it's a real pain. I have been stuck waiting to recharge where somebody else is already on the charging point. So you wait 40 minutes for them to finish. Then you wait another 40 minutes for your car to charge up so you can carry on. That's what was that? An, an hour and a half extra travel time in a journey that takes you more than one charge on your car. Um, it's a nuisance. So maybe something that we need to do is to think about simplifying the whole of life being a bit more contemplative and slowing down a bit. So we're not saying, yeah, I've got to be there in an hour. We're saying, actually, it doesn't matter if it takes me two hours. I do have time to stop and recharge. But it is a big thing and it's it's not always easy. Um, I do struggle a bit with the thing in the carbon zero, zero carbon document that talks about just relating this to church business. It, it's no good just relating it to church business. If we are, if we're up for saying as church that a greener lifestyle is an integral part of the expression of our Christian faith, then this needs to be the whole of life. We cannot kid ourselves that sharing a lift to church on Sunday morning or riding our bike to the PCC on Wednesday night is actually going to sort out the climate crisis. The little things matter, but um, that's really not going to change it. So incentive Hugh was saying how do we get people on board how do we get people to want to do these things and I think one thing that's really important is making this fun now for most people for a lot of people anyway doing things with somebody else is really important it can be quite hard doing stuff on your own especially if it's new so um oh where to start with this so car sharing to start with so Frida in the chat said she lives close to the church but often drives because she's got heavy stuff to, to take with her so my first question Frida would be who else shows up in church about the same time as you and um, possibly drives somewhere near your front door on their way um, maybe you could have a, a list up in church where people sign up and say I'm coming from this place at this time. I will be taking this route. I will have so many spaces in my car. Who can I pick up on the way? Maybe one of those people's going past your door, Frida, I don't know. But I'd also like to say actually that it is still okay to use your car if there is no alternative. Just think about other options first. But sometimes, sometimes we do just have to do that. So uh, a few other ideas, walking again more fun with somebody else. One of my local schools, uh, they have a walking bus. They meet in a place that's about three quarters of a mile from the school and they walk together. They have great fun, they love it. I think it works for grown ups as well as children. Bike groups too. I, I live on a lovely little rural lane and when I do go out in my car, I am forever infuriated by the large groups of bikes who are riding up and down my lane, but it is actually good fun doing it together. What about if people are going to walk, give them something to do on the way, um, get people to take pictures of all the different flowers they see en route, ask them how many things they can find that are yellow on the way, ask them where they saw something that made them think about God, and then when they get to church, give them a space in the service to share that. You can, if you're walking or biking, you could make the travel worship in itself, you know, do, do it as a mini pilgrimage, your 10 minute walk to church. How awesome would that be? And uh, if you're an amazing travel, uh, public transport plans that are going on here are up for it, or if your church is up for it, why don't you change your service time so it ties in with the time that the bus stops outside your church? It's really annoying if you get on the bus. Um, arrive at church at 10 o'clock and the service doesn't start till 11. Change your service time. Um, somebody mentioned Sustrans, I think it was Hugh. Sustrans once a year have an event that they call the big walk and wheel event. Maybe not join in with that, but why not have, have some sort of event in your church? We used to do um, back to church Sunday, didn't we? Or we did anyway. Um, Maybe you could have 
use a different mode of transport to get to church Sunday. Invite the teenagers to come on their roller skates and their skateboards and then to tell you about it. Um, all sorts of things, you know, get, get your wheelchair users to talk about their experience of getting to church in their wheelchair or their, their, their mobility scooter or whatever, all sorts of things. Um, have a brainstorming session and work out lots more ideas like this for yourselves. There's all sorts of stuff out there. Um, Hilary, thank you so much for all that you've, the ideas that you've given us and the gentle way that you have uh, introduced us to activism. I've really enjoyed listening to you. I'm sure there'll be people will want to hang around and ask you questions. I know Annie's put a question about clergy housing, but I'm just really keen to bring Drew in, who has waited so patiently to the very end. But Hilary, thank you so much. Um, but Drew, if I could just draw you in just for the last couple of minutes. Uh, so Drew James is a retired Liverpool solicitor and a member of Christchurch Toxter Park. Since he retired, he's been an active, he's been active with Extinction Rebellion and Christian Climate Action, and he's now coordinating a campaign to persuade the National Trust to cease banking with Barclays Bank. So we're interested to hear all about that, Drew. Thanks ever so much. Hi everyone, um, just by way of a little bit of background, I've put in the chat a link to a report called Banking on Climate Chaos 2022 produced by the Rainforest Action Network. And this finds that um, of all the banks in the world, uh, Barclays Bank is the bank in Europe that uh, puts the most finance into uh, industries that uh, emit fossil fuels. So it's the it's the largest financer of fossil fuel emissions in in banking finance of it in in Europe. Uh, they also happen to be the bank for the National Trust. The National Trust is the largest conservation charity uh, in Europe. Uh, something like 750 hectares of open land that it maintains and protects for the for the public use. Over 500 properties and houses, um, and I'm. Pretty, pretty sure, it's not empirical this, but pretty sure that many people of faith, including many people who go to church, uh, are in the National Trust. And uh, those who I've spoken to have been horrified to learn that um, Barclays Bank has been spending 136 billion pounds on fossil fuels since the Paris Climate Accord. Um, so just drawing a little on what Hillary said before, if, if we as Christians are called to action, this is a, there's an entry level action that everybody who's in the National Trust or, or who knows someone who's in the National Trust can get involved with. Uh, a resolution has been submitted to the National Trust AGM. It's gone through their validation process. So it, it, so it will be uh, at, uh, there for voting at the AGM in early November. And this calls on the National Trust to end its banking relationship with Barclays Bank if they don't adopt a published uh, ethical targeted policy for reduction of fossil fuels. Um, there's not enough time to explain why, but the existing climate policy that Barclays have uh, is full of obfuscation and greenwashing. It really doesn't cut the mustard. Um, uh, th their record over the last six years shows where they stand. They're, they're very much in the fossil fuel camp. So what, what's needed, please? Um, from all of us of faith uh, who, who uh, have any um, connection with the National Trust is when the autumn magazine comes out, which is usually late August, early September, uh, don't throw it in the bin. Uh, take the voting papers out uh, and don't, as I've done in the past, throw them in the recycling. Um, actually use your vote. Um, something like only 2% of National Trust members bother to vote. There's five and a half million National Trust members. So uh, having a, a significant cohort of people of faith using their votes in favor of the resolution can make a, a, a very real difference. Um, and, and of course, it, it's also a, a way of calling on, on people to think about their own banking arrangements. What, why am I banking with Barclays or with HSBC Bank? Why, why am I not moving my bank to my banking um, relations to uh, a, a much better bank. There are there are plenty out there. Um, 
I think I think that's probably all the time they're going to let me have. Sorry, I was muted there. Thanks ever so much, Drew. That was really useful. And yeah, that's a again a really easy way to take uh, action, isn't it? And to, to, to make a real difference as well. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we are we have two minutes left till we close. Um, we have had lots of questions and really good points in the in the chat. We will um, email out some of the notes and some of the information that has been shared with you this evening. But is there anybody with uh, any pressing questions that they need answers for tonight? You could just uh, just unmute yourself and just ask and then direct them at anybody that you feel could answer. But yeah, we're, we're, we're keen to finish on time. But if anybody would like to ask a question, please, please do so now. Annie? Um, it's not really a question. It's just, a, I'll just to say that anything that's been shared in, in the chat uh, comments, links, etc. We will share by email and very quickly, um, particularly relating to campaigns. So you can choose to act on it and then share it far and wide. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Okay. I can't believe we finished a minute before we were due to. Oh, can I just say thank you so much for everybody who has contributed this evening. Uh, it's been really uh, a really interesting evening and uh, lots of food for thought and things that we can act upon and some simple changes that we can make. Uh, I'm sure some of us have probably got more questions uh, than we thought we'd have. But again, please feel free. I will stay on at the end. So if people want to put any questions in the chat. Uh, I'll hang around and we'll see if we can get some answers to you. Uh, it may not be this evening, but we'll do our best to get those uh, answers for you. Um, please book on to our other two uh, workshops that are happening as well in July and September. And again, if you want any more information on those, please do get in touch with Face for Change. You can email myself, Zara or Annie uh, about that. But thank you so much. And as I said, I'll hang around if anybody wants to to ask anything but thank you all for your time it's been a pleasure to spend the evening with you and thanks to our speakers god bless you all thank you everyone thank you emma thank you <clears throat> happy happy to hang around too i'll mute yeah. myself me too stephen thanks for all your comments you type in like crazy. <laughs> Some really good points. If anybody wants somebody... to unmute themselves and say anything, please feel free to do that. While we're a smaller group. I think that's very practical ideas, though, weren't they? Um, yeah. I think that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's yeah. it's starting with you know small steps, isn't it? Every it's a cliche, but every marathon starts with the first step. Yeah. Thank you. I just have one question because I'm very aware that the the diocese footprint is slightly different to Liverpool City region. Okay. Yeah. So we yeah. kind of we push out towards you know Warrington Way and East Lanks and that way. So kind of. Are you able to support the diocese and churches that are kind of out there thinking about wider? It's a kind of sort of, are you having conversations with our neighbouring councils? It's one of those really awkward things where you've got a boundary, you know, whether it's a diocese boundary or local authority boundary, our, our remit is kind of quite contained. So, yeah, our, our responsibility, certainly our funding, ends at the Liverpool City region boundary. But, yeah, we do work really close with Warrington, with West Lancashire, uh, with Cheshire West and Chester, with, with North Wales authorities as well, because we recognise, you know, the whole travel to work picture is much, much bigger, you know, huge numbers of people travel in and out to adjoining areas. So what we could do, if it's, if there are specific things about Warrington, you know, there's some really good offices at Warrington. So if you wanted to pick up some detail there, um, I could give you the details of my equivalent at Warrington Borough Council, for example. Uh, but yeah, our, our remit does, does it's one of those annoying things, but it's it's the way things work. It does stop at the boundary, I'm afraid. <laughs> but just to pick that up, Zara, I mean, we do work across the border anyway. So, I mean, in my area of electricity, or uh, energy, the, the network operator, people like SP Energy Networks, they work across those boundaries anyway. So 
you know, we might not, there might not necessarily be an exact equivalent to sort of Hugh and myself, but we know the the kind of people that would pick this up. And again, everybody's looking at it and everybody's doing work. So, you know, it, it might not fit perfectly in terms of symmetrically to somebody else, but, but yeah, there are, there are people there that work and, and who know us and know that we, you know, we know the work that they're doing as well. So happy to share that if we can. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And um, really good questions are, I mean, just, just for information, it's the diocese covers Warrington, Wigan and West Lanx. So, and it's boroughs this side of the Mersey. So Wirral is the diocese of Chester. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I just have, a, have a, another minute on top of my couple of minutes? You go for it. Please uh, the, the, do. The trust is a peculiarity in that a majority vote at AGM doesn't actually carry the day. The trustees, um, uh, uh, it, it's purely an advisory vote. Um, so we, even if we had a, a million voters for uh, the resolution, the trustees could still decide uh, to stay with Barclays. Uh, at the moment, we're in a little bit of an interlude because we're waiting to see what their response is. Uh, we're waiting to hear if there's uh, an indication as to whether or not they'll support the resolution or not. Uh, three years ago, the Trust took uh, an ethical decision to divest all its own investments from fossil fuels. So what we're doing is calling on them really to just to, to build on an existing ethical decision that's been taken. If they want to behave ethically, then, then this is something they really should be doing. Um, once we, we're clearer as to what their attitude is going to be, um, and if, 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 as we suspect, it will be to oppose the um, resolution, then a, a campaign will be rolled out through July and, it, and into August. And that's where I, I would hope that organisations like Faith for Change would be willing to adopt it. Um, one easy way in which the message can be broadcast is by attaching an email signature um, so that every time an email goes out, there's a little box at the bottom with a message just reminding people to use their vote if they're in the National Trust. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll contact Annie over that, um, um, I expect, in, uh, probably within the next week or two. Thank you. It'd be, it'd be great, Mark and Hugh, if we could um, keep in touch and if, if there's anything that you think is kind of... Uh, relates to the diocese in particular if you could let us know that would be really fantastic because we don't always we don't always pick up on everything of course, of course. I think I think it's one thing, yeah one thing phil that might be of interest the we host the the regional net zero hub um which is part of government um but it funds a series of a set of experts that we host but for, again for the whole of the northwest um on and they do things like you know solar um, so we've got a, a set of business models that work for for solar for communities. So whether they be for schools or or, you know, or other community groups. So again, there might be something there that we can pick up um, and put you in touch with, because again, you know, if there's if there's work that's already done, and, and I know the work that you're doing already, but there might be there might be some some areas for collaboration or work that we can do that. No, definitely, it's early days for us. So anything we can learn off you, we really want to learn. No, and it's a very good point, Phil, and, and equally, you know, it's this kind of information, information, information as we're developing, you know, the network of walking and cycling routes, uh, you know, bus services improvements, bus service improvements, you know, we can keep you abreast of those because, you know, as, as many of you were saying on the chat here, they can be part of a travel plan, they can be part of that incentive package to get more people walking, cycling, catching the bus to meetings or to church and yeah, it's just sharing that information, isn't it? And all of us promoting it. Well, Annie, will everybody get each other's email addresses? Or? Yeah, because um, um, it's been the meeting's been set up. Oh, they won't get each other's, but we have everybody's because it was this was set up through Eventbrite, so we can send people information. Obviously, we'll send on slides. <coughs> Excuse I'll, put, me. I'll put mine um, in the chat <clears throat> if you could hang on. That'd be great. Yeah, and contacts as well. Um, just really, really pleased to to have both of you um, still here, Mark and Hugh. And you know, thanks for giving up your time. Um, it's it's glad. You know, I'm really glad to be on the City Region Climate Partnership and Nature Connected Board because it 
it does kind of give you an in into kind of strategic level activity. And whilst Faiths for Change is leading on the prophetic side of this, engaging kind of whole church communities, particularly as roots into the rest of the community. Um, I think one of you said very early on, you know, nobody can do this alone. We can't. Um, but um, one of Zara's projects is, is working over actually on the Wirral, um, and it's working with different world faith communities in, and again is a net zero program um, linked quite closely to helping Wirral Council achieve uh, call to their climate strategy. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of got links both sides of the river um, and very active ones as, as well. So, but I think some of your suggestions around looking at, you know, certainly very localized travel plans and opportunities and also kind of strategic level uh, might be worth exploring, Phil. Um, I think, you know, at, for the whole program, I think that would be really useful. Um, and, and, you know, the whole kind of charging points and, but also things like bicycle stands as well, you know, because, yeah those kind of things do make a difference absolutely yeah. you know if you know you can park your bike safely you may well be more likely to cycle to church exactly mm. and yeah tra and without getting into detail i think yet uh, it's come up in the chat you know travel plans that they've been promoted by government for a long time but they work you know people that are produced whether it's a school travel plan or for a workplace or for a yeah. site or for a festival they work you think about how people are going to travel right from the start you think about what you want to get out of it you want to get a certain percentage of people walking cycling using the bus uh, there'll be certain people who can't and that's finally making provision for all of those users and planning for it yeah we'd so. like to do one for faiths for change as well we're kind of working towards becoming um a carbon literate organization pretty much all of us have now done the carbon literacy projects uh carbon literacy course um, and we have delivered that in as part um part of the first round of LCR Environment Fund uh, with Energy Projects Plus and Zero Carbon Liverpool. Um, but as part of that, we're looking at our, you know, carbon footprint, um, but also the kind of things that we do to negate the carbon footprint as well through some of the activity that we do. So yeah, some help on, on that front as well would be super. So we can plan less vehicle journeys. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Sorry, this is just a very quickie. Sorry, I wondered, oh, had, you, had you seen the Daily Post report about buses uh, in Liverpool City area and how it's sort of contra to the Liverpool City region plan? Um, it's supposed to be all the varying cuts and redirections or whatever. This is supposed to be happening by September the 2nd. It's a really tough one, Frida, um, mm. that we, we were given money by the government to basically support bus services yeah. during the pandemic. So obviously when people weren't travelling or travelling as often, uh, we got money from government that we gave to the bus operators because frankly many of them were gone out of business if it hadn't been for that money. That money now comes to an end in October. So unfortunately, yes, there, there will need to be reductions uh, to cut costs and that's the that's the stark reality the, i suppose the the issue is frida that the more people that we can get traveling by bus the more viable the more affordable it becomes for everybody else you know buses don't run if people don't use them um so it's kind of it's one of those users that lose it very often the more people we can get using the bus the more profitable and effective and efficient they will become um, and that's why it's such a big part of our plan. But you're absolutely right. There's a big challenge later on in this autumn, and we're all very concerned about that. You can't. Uh, you as far as I mean, I'm, I'm not a bus traveller. I have to admit that. But as far as I'm aware, you, you can't get from. I live in Fazakerley. You can't get from Fazakerley to Halewood on one bus. You know, it's 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 a nightmare journey. Back in my working days, I I was I had to do it once or twice. Oh, it was a it was a nightmare. Twenty minutes down the motorway by car, and, and about two hours to go by public transport. 
I mean, so I don't know what's what the solution to that one, but you know. So the Maru there, the buses on the Sunday are now already, already cut back to once every two hours. You know, well, how is that feasible? You can't go to use that for church, can you? Once every two hours, you know, and wait, maybe if, if, you, if the timing's wrong, maybe wait over an hour to go back home again. It, uh, completely, it's a big challenge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a big, big challenge. Um, you know, I, walk, the, I, I thought it would be within 50 minutes walk, and I do walk, you see. But if, it, if it went into the centre of St. Terrence, it would be, you said the bus is only every two hours to get down there, so it's, it's, it's unfeasible. <laughs> I, I do sympathise, and you know, we it, it makes it very difficult, doesn't it? We're promoting the you know the green travel message, the net zero message, mm -hmm. and at the same time, we know that there are some big challenges out there. Um, whether it's long journeys or buses that have been taken off, it is it is a big challenge. Um, I suppose coming back to what we were saying there about travel planning, and I think somebody said in the in the discussion, you know, we're not we're not making the car an enemy here. There are certain journeys where the car is exactly the right way to travel. To go pick up some flat pack furniture from just down the road in a large retail warehouse and um, very difficult to do that on the bus yeah. but actually you know if you can make most of your trips by by foot by bike by bus great you know save those journeys for where the car is the viable choice if it's getting from Fazakali to Halewood great but as I said in the chat you know many of those journeys we make now are actually really really short but it's just making sense it's making sensible travel choices and the car is not an enemy, you know, we need to make less use, we need to make it less less dominant and less prominent, but it's there, it's still there in terms of how we will need to travel in the future. Mm. Well, can I just ask you, what are the, the plans for cycle routes and things? I'm, I'm a keen road biker and, you know, sometimes I feel as if I take my life into my own hands and my husband had a terrible accident last year on his bike um, and my two boys cycle, you know, and I... I'm terrified when they go out on their bikes because you know the, the roads just aren't safe are there plans for safer cycle lanes to get sort of to you know not I mean I live quite rural so you know we can go on a bike ride but are there plans to sort of you know link up towns so that we can get to places safer I, I can pick up on that one I'll, I'll send you a link um, to our plan to our walking cycling plan so yeah to, to answer your question yes uh, a network of safe cycle routes across the city region that can be used from people who are 80 to 80. You know, that that's the vision. And we want much, much more of that. Mm. And I'm exactly the same. You know, we made journeys as a family on a bike during lockdown because mm. the roads were quiet. Mm. Then that's not a journey I'd want my son to make now. It's a journey I think twice about sometimes as well going down the main road where I live here. So okay. we all want those safe facilities. I, I completely agree. And that's part of our, that's part of our strategy. Mm. Yeah, okay, thank you. Right, are we done? Good. That was great, thanks. It was, it was brilliant. Thank you so much for all your input and you know, it, it's great to have the experts because obviously we don't have all the answers. Um, so thank you so much for coming on board and you know, it seems that perhaps there'll be a bit more of a partnership as well in the future with, with yourselves, Mark and Hugh. So thank you very much for that. And uh, lovely to have you with us, Frida. And Stephen, and thanks again for your input as well. So I think we're done. It's tea time. Thanks, everybody. Oh, well done, thanks, everybody. Phil. Thanks for your input too. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye now.